question, perhaps the panelists have thoughts about, but also just for the room. One of the things that strikes me about our, our conversations is how um, qualified and tempered and humble much of the computer science presentations, the framing is we don't know things, we are still working on things, it's very tempered. And thinking about the kind of private face of computer science versus the public claims, whether that computer scientists make, but also others make on your behalf about what the power of this field can do. And so in sociology, we have a long history of studying what we call the Janus face of science. That is, lowercase science and all of the ways in which it's social and it's, and it's political and it's, you know, the, the, it's a human endeavor versus capital S science in which to get the grants or to get the attention, you make it overly, uh, overly powerful in its predictions or its power. And so thinking about that, um, what responsibility do you have as members of the field to either let that play out Get the get the, the get the benefits of the public face while being humble and qualified in private, or do you have a responsibility to address that gap? And one of the very spe specific quotes I'm thinking about is this New York Times article that came out profiling Donald Knuth, one of the I'm not saying his last name, but one of the founders of computer science. The article you should read is called like the Yoda of Silicon Valley. It's a great article. And in there, it's very, at the very end, the last paragraph, he says, in the beginning, we were so worried no one was paying attention to us. Now I'm worried too many people are paying attention to us. And so what responsibility do you have and how can we support you in your endeavors to um, own up to the fact that these predictions and this, the claims made on behalf of the field are not what they are made out to be? Give grants to people with, uh, <laughs> with specific words as opposed to overarching grandiose claims. And it goes back to that, the grand claim gets the money. I, 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 that's, yeah, and I mean, I mean it both in an academic and non-academic sense, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to give money to Elon Musk. Oh, this is being recorded. <laughs> Everyone wants to give money to Elon Musk, and no one wants to give money to as many people in this room. Um, I think knowing when you hear snake oil, right? If you hear, in general, a piece of technology is going to solve some grand task, you should know it's bullshit. <laughs> um, and, and don't give it your time, attention, money. I think that's a good start. I think another is um, to... I, one thing that I would like to come out of this workshop is a set of shared resources, information resources. And with you calling out this particular issue, I realized that we should, uh, we should make clear here are, some, mm -hmm. here are some reasons for skepticism. And here are good papers that, that express the skepticism and the limits. And uh, this is where we think you know, the real theoretical or sorry, the real science, whether it's computer science or theoretical computer science or something else in CS, this is where we think it is. Um, I assume that in other fields that are represented here, you have the same issues. And it might be good to, uh, to collect high quality starting points or reading points from, from the different fields. Yeah, I think. Are we being too timid in our suggestions? What else do you I, want I to hear? I love the idea of a reading list. I keep like writing down things from everyone's talks. That would be phenomenal if people think they reference. I, I think it's a great set of interventions. Thank you so much, Luha. Um, you know, we tried to do this. There was a, a series of uh, working groups put on at Duke University. Charmaine Royale and Mike Bamshad were uh, really, I think, the main organizers around trying to figure out some way that genetic testing and ancestry and all of these different technologies could find a gold standard or just some consensus statements. Mm -hmm. And there were these really um, just 
you know, detailed minority reports. So we had these clickers and we'd all vote on, we'd do workshops and break out into small groups. It was a lot of work. And there was a sense that these would be published somewhere. They never were. Um, and I think it goes back to some of um, what has been alluded to in terms of some, some of the genetics talks, is that there is quite a bit of work being done in, uh, in academia, which is more open and grant funded, et cetera. But there's quite a bit that's done in the private sphere. And living in Silicon Valley, it's pretty clear that it's even worse in this case, right? In terms of the, the ways people are validated, right? The kind of Facebook move fast and break things. There is a sense of we don't really have to <coughs> play by the rules. And so I think it would be great, you know, to follow on Cynthia's point, if people in, you know, some circles of computing and computer science did come up with a, you know, uh, a, a really important set of papers, like paper one, paper two, paper three, the kinds of things that, you know, show the architecture, show the problems, show the limitations, and um, really create a conversation around kind of com com computing science ethics, if you will, and try to come to some consensus. And I think that the the issue with the, with the parallel that I'm bringing up with the genetic testing industry is that people already had companies, they were already invested in certain, uh, certain directions and certain domains. It was very hard to get those people to agree on, on something. And a lot of it was proprietary. They didn't want to talk about what they could share. Um, and so I do think it would be important to have a set of papers from within the field right. of very thoughtful people like yourselves. I think something else that would be really good that just occurs to me now um, is to have an informed critique of papers that make certain kinds of claims, but by informed, I actually mean by informed with the expertise of the other people in this room. So to match up with a computer scientist and go through what the claims are and then give the bigger context, the kinds of things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that would be incredibly powerful. Yeah. Helen wants to talk. Hi, I'm, I'm going a little back in the weeds <laughs> versus this great question that we started discussing. <clears throat> and it, it has to do with this discussion of features, so it has a little, maybe it's both Cynthia's and Jamie's talks. Anyone can answer who can, and it started off with Maritza's talk this morning in that, you know, in, in this, in, par in the, in the function where, where it goes race and then you have these exogenous factors. So the question, first of all, um, Cynthia, are we, in your discussion, are we talking always supervised learning? And in that sense, are we always relying on the analyst to make a decision about what features, and you know, in, in your reduction of dimensionality, I know there's a mathematical part of it that I didn't follow, but, but it's, it's sort of as if um, there's a preconception about which features are salient mm -hmm. that must come from what you want out on the on the other end, like mm -hmm. what the scientist does is say, well, you know, I think these and these features are systematically related to the output that I'm in interested in. So you kind of look at a particular, you f focus or you gather your data on a particular s set of features. And so when um, we, the public, are hearing all of these fantastical claims about machine learning, we're given to believe that you know, they're these smart machines and you just like put them out into the world and they learn stuff. You know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's hardly anything that, that the human has to go in and do, but what I'm hearing from some of the talks and even the, you know, the remember the one about language king, king and doctor, nurse or doctor, doctor, like it's very driven by the output that is of interest. Mm -hmm. So it feels not surprising to me that bias and discrimination or unfair discrimination 
would be the upshot if the computer scientist or the, any scientist is sort of playing the social scientist as they gather the data together. I, I hope yeah. there's some coherence in what I'm trying to yeah. ask here. I, I do Thanks. think one of the, so, so I like your question sort of saying like, we should be thinking about the features we collect as salient for the task we're ultimately uh, performing. Best case scenario, totally agree with you. Practical application of how most people talk about and use machine learning. I won't, I won't critique that here, but uh, I, I think in general, like, m computer scientists like to abstract and like to be general purpose. That is like general purpose as general as humanly possible is like a fundamental tenet of computing, right? Like ignore as much detail as possible about the problem and like abstract that all away and like come up with the most general purpose solution. I mean, I, I, I may be being unkind to no. computer science, but like I think in general the like break these into little pieces that you can reuse in as many other places as possible is fundamental to the way computer scientists think about solving problems. And so I think an example is sort of all this stuff we can do for machine learning without thinking about what we're ultimately trying to use the system for. But, but let me add, um, I mentioned some work in progress toward the end of the talk. And I talked about explicitly you know, having a test for saying that the features in the data are, are not sufficient for the task. Mm -hmm. And so I want to explicitly call out the option of a learning algorithm. And I was thinking in terms of supervised learning, and I'll tell you why in a sec. But why a learning, when a learning algorithm has the option of saying, these data are crap, you know, <laughs> we can't do what you want us to do with them. And the, the attitude in general is always, well, we do the best we can given the data. And under certain circumstances, that may make perfect sense. You've got some horrible new plague and you're just doing everything you can to try. But, but a lot of times you can just say no, you know, reject the premise. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to have this explicitly called out in the algorithms. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, by the way, for not using, I mean, for thinking that I like to think more about the supervised <coughs> case rather than the unsupervised case is that if you have an, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert. From what little I know about unsupervised learning, there is some sort of implicit distance involved. It's like when you talk about clustering, you're sort of saying, well, these guys are close to each other compared to uh, these others. Well, close to means you need a metric for determining closeness. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do that, you need a metric. And then, I, I don't know, that's, that's a hard problem. Yeah. OK, hey, so um, based over here, um, so, so, uh, kind of based on what uh, Ruha was asking, um, I was in the manifesto movement group yesterday. And kind of one of the points I, that came up um, I wrote a few bullet points. The, the main two, though, the first two that I really think are something we really need to ask ourselves are um, should we have a political ideology as a group, algorithmic fairness? Um, I think typically uh, the theoretical computer science, because it can, with complexity theory and this sort, can take an apolitical stance on things. Um, but an apolitical stance is a political stance. Mm -hmm. And in this case, um, when, we, when there are big claims in the media of the sort, uh, there are refutations sometimes. Some um, scientists speak out, um, but the refutations are like, well, you know, technically in this scenario, it won't work this way and that way. And it gets really technical real quick, and that itself can be timid um, in kind of the way Ruha was talking. So. Uh, why should we have a political stance as a field um, of algorithmic fairness? And I guess as far as movement goes, it feels like there's a big cultural component to this. Mm -hmm. uh, the way we write our papers and abstracts, um, are we going to have an apolitical nature? Or are we going to, from the get-go, have a um, 
cohesive political ideology that we decide upon as a field in defining a movement or a uh, manifesto. <laughs> You're looking at me like I should I just, <laughs> Well, I'm wondering if you have an answer. So my guess is that the, uh, Deirdre. Can Deirdre have a mic, please? Every decision is political. <laughs> we, we started off the workshop saying fairness is political. I wanted to pick up like the norm shaping and, and how do you get it out there. And um, you know, we have this algorithmic fairness and opacity working group. We have people who are doing work from a range of different fields coming in. We had a scholar, Hoyt Long, who's been using machine learning techniques, but to, to understand literary texts. And the thing, and Andy Smart could actually talk to this probably too, but one of the things that was most interesting to me in reading his article in contrast to some of the other articles was how specific and detailed he was about the subjective choices of his mm -hmm. algorithms. Mm -hmm. The data, the ch like, and it was so beautiful and it would be really interesting, I think, to actually have some computer scientists in, in theory read that paper mm -hmm. um, and to think about the ways in which you might use the approaches to being specific. And I think it goes to the single purpose, what was the rest of the? Single purpose built. Yeah. Single case purpose built. Single case purpose built, like actually treating everything mm -hmm. as it was this very bespoke thing. And you know, it's it's like the methodology is so explicit and um, you don't ever see that, as I, I think you were saying, or it's not foregrounded. And it might be interesting to just look at different ways in which you might talk about the choices. And so that might be something that would be really productive is to look at some of these other disciplines that are using machine learning tools. Um, and how they talk about their choices. Because I think you can do it in a more kind of bottom up way too, mm -hmm. which informs the way everybody starts to talk about their work rather than just having it be in the media. Because it, you know, mm -hmm. culture change often has to come <coughs> up from the bottom. But let me not duck the thing yeah. too much. Uh, or who's the author? Quite long. Quite long. Quite long. Yeah, I, I can <coughs> send it around. So, in order not to duck completely, I think, I think the answer is yes. That I don't know whether I would use the word political, but having really well-informed uh, principles and guidelines and calling for adherence to those, I think is the right thing to do. I don't necessarily know how to write them and what should be included, but that again should be one of the, you know, that would be a major accomplishment so the workshop would be to start something like that. I actually think those two are very related. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are, I think especially within science, there are so many ways that the science march as such kind of devolved into, or not devolved, but you know, in an interesting way. Um, bifurcated, splintered into these different conversations about how science is always already political because mm -hmm. some people were wondering should they even be out there and other people were saying oh it's always been political and by the way we've been left out and marginalized and you've been experimenting on us etc so science is always political like most things in culture but I think calling it explicitly political or having a manifesto you know raises hackles in some in some domains and I think that that, that might be fine if that's what you want to do but there's an acknowledgement that needs to happen, right? That mm -hmm. it's always already in a social context that is highly politicized and we take certain things for granted in ways that are legacy effects of imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, all these things. But what she just pointed to, Deidre, in terms of that paper and really um, having authors be conscious and explicitly state where they're coming from. It's kind of sort of like Donna Haraway's Situated Knowledges, a very, very old essay, sort of this feminist, um, you know, science studies approach to all knowledge has a home and has a kind of um, a place, a mind from which it stems, etc. And so I think bridging those two approaches, I don't know if manifesto is the right word after the Unabomber, but you know, <laughs> maybe things do need to be Unabombed. I'm not sure. Um, but there is, a, there is a way to explicitly acknowledge that science is not neutral. 
or mm -hmm. objective. We can, we can do all kinds of things to try and get better outcomes, but I, I sometimes think acknowledging the politics and, and including them might actually lead to some better outcomes, sort of like your, what was the term, pseudo-randomness stuff? Just incorporating that into the algorithm, algorithm if, if that's possible, right? The what we don't know and, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So I will want to thank all the presenters um, over here. Thank all the presenters for their uh, appropriate modesty. <laughs> but I, I have been studying a lot the collapse of civilizations. And we seem to be on the edge of collapse with climate change and other very complicated problems. And a lot of us non-scientists look to science to sort of, oh, you guys will come up with the answer. Or even other scientists do. And could you just talk a little more about that in the context of what I th see as a collapsing civilization? <laughs> I, I do think if we're talking about the context of climate change, science does have some solutions. People don't want to hear them. And people don't want to implement them and don't want to take responsibility. This is, I'm in no way an expert. <laughs> Yeah. and political things aside. Uh, I think in general, it's interesting to think about whether science is in the business of persuading. Mm -hmm. um, because I think in general, we don't think of what we're doing as like trying to convince anyone of anything. We say, here's the evidence we have. And I think that maybe we should talk about whether or not we're in the business of persuasion. Uh, outside of outside of science, but maybe inside as well. I guess we do it inside. So um, perhaps to follow up on a couple of the earlier um, comments about sort of the political issues here. And this is again sort of an overarching comment about the, the conferences. I've been a little uncomfortable with even the, the sort of terminology of algorithmic fairness. And to think about the sort of relationship between are we talking about fairness, are we talking about neutrality, are we talking about justice? Mm -hmm. right? Because algorithmic fairness you know, tends to leave exist, the, the concept to my mind tends to leave ex pre existing distributions of power sort of in place. And then we're just sort of like, how do we get to fairness? Mm -hmm. And then as I was thinking through this, I was thinking, well, okay, so there, you know, there's this wide, you know, very uh, uh, widely read, you know, uh, popular book out there, Algorithms of Oppression. Right, which has been getting a lot of attention. And it just occurred to me, well, algorithms of oppression, right, sort of presupposes the idea of algorithms of liberation, right? And so should we be talking about, right, is it possible to talk about algorithms of liberation, algorithms of reparation, algorithms of, of abolition? I have no idea, because I wouldn't know an algorithm if it bit me in the butt. <laughs> But I am curious, right, to think about the algorithms in those terms, sort of moving away from fairness to justice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or what would they look like, I guess? You know, where might they manifest? What might they look like? So, I think... One thing that they might do is um, uncover or discover, uh, um, sorry, I'm losing my language, <laughs> but uncover or, or discover pernicious interactions and behaviors and effects and comb through lots and lots of history and data and, and pull things out mm -hmm. and then exhibit it for, well, the evidence and now what do we do next? But uh, so a lot of sort of useful m monitoring and, and testing, if I can understand how to do these, these tests. Yeah. What else? <laughs> I think we need to listen to the people who are talking about abolition and help them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not abolition, like if you're talking about yeah. algorithms of abolition, <laughs> we need to talk to the people who have been thinking about abolition for a long time and help them. Like I don't think we have like, we may have tools that can help, but I think we're not going to discover something newer or better than they've already thought about. And we can think about how the tools we have can help. Exactly. But there are many realms in which algorithms are objectively helpful and useful. 
sure. and and you know algorithms for medicine that you know control your 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 pacemakers and, and I mean there are just tons and tons of uh, beneficial uses. Yeah, and I guess I'm thinking of like algorithms to readjust balances and patterns. Right. As opposed to readjust more electrical impulses. So if you if your brain were like wildly computationally effective, how would you deploy it to I'm asking you, what would you do if you had all of the thinking power and speaking power that you needed? What would you do to uh, affect the balance of power? I mean, I, well, Nancy can answer, right? Or it looks like <laughs> Zach. Too. It looks like Zach has a comment prepared. So Zach, you know, let's have Zach quick, answer. Quick aside: first. the only I, I thought of this. Mm -hmm. um, I, you all probably were aware of the fact that, like, right around when the ACA was like, it was looking as though the ACA might be repealed. Uh, there was a very simple uh, piece of software that someone wrote, which allowed uh, you to text to a fax machine. We talked about faxes earlier mm -hmm. today. Uh, and completely flooded the input to all of the fax machines on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think like, you know, I know that's not like technologically like fascinating from a computing <laughs> perspective, but like, like simple ideas like that can be pretty effective uh, as agents of, you know, change. I, I just wanted to say that we have about five people in line. Um, oh, we can, sorry. yeah, uh, we can, uh, mm -hmm. we can do this. We could take all the questions at one time. I know that we're sort of at the end of our time, but we're also at the end of the day, so we can. I don't know what your preference is, Cynthia. You decide. Okay, I, 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 I think. You're in charge. Is it okay? I'm asking if, if we. I think. I think if we take these questions, we yeah. <laughs> we can Go extend. The, we've got time. Um, so I wanted to go back to the first few questions um, uh, the, uh, where um, Deirdre mentioned uh, the norms in the field and I think Helen was um, mentioning sort of what effectively is like perspectives that you get from the leaders. Sorry, and, you and, hold the mic closer. Sorry, yes. Um, and I want to push back on Jamie and Cynthia a little bit because as I'm a computer science PhD and my trajectory with uh, other interdisciplinary um, computer science PhDs ends up being that this type of work tends not to be rewarded. If you go too specific, if you talk about context, that's for, that's a specialized field. And so I don't think it's quite fair to say like, oh, well, we're just computer scientists, everything has to be general, that's for the, the specialists to do. And I think that actually hinders us in sort of rewarding the type of work that considers the social and political context of, of the work that we're doing. So could you, I mean, revisit that a little bit in terms of what we can do for um, valuing this kind of work inside of our field? Because otherwise, I mean, myself included, we just leave the field, so. <laughs> I think that if you have a um, very domain specific, are you talking about having some kind of very domain specific application or? Well, I mean, if, if talking about political context of an algorithm is specific, and I mean, <laughs> so you're you're asking me about uh, what to do about certain kinds, making sure that certain kinds of computer science work is rewarded. Can you elaborate on what kinds of computer science work you mean? Um, can we reward the kinds of work that? Give me an example. Um, well, so ACM making Pat Star an ACM conference is a great step. Um, but that was, that's one of our only examples of rewarding this kind of political, social context within our field. Otherwise, these subfields get marginalized. But what kind of work? Give me an example of the kind of work that, like, a particular sort of thing. Much of what we've heard here. Uh, <laughs> I think, so, so since, since I can't get an answer out of you, let me make up what you might have in mind, and we'll go with that for now. I, um, so, so let's suppose that um, you found, so you did a very in-depth, you, you, you did something that has to do with loans. You did some kind of work that has to do with lo loans and you had managed to find a way of doing a better prediction that was less 
objectionable and also accurate and so on. I think that, that there are a lot of ways of getting that really recognized. In fact, there's a lot of pressure in the other direction. It's like, what are you doing writing about this general stuff? We want to see you work with real data sets and have an impact on real people. I just, I too. So, so, so I'm saying there, there, I think that you can get a lot of recognition for that sort of work. Are you saying from an academic perspective specifically? I'm, yeah, so I'm just talking about academic mm -hmm. norms in terms of if we want to think about the sort of social context of our algorithms, what the right norms within computer science as a field as we teach students and as we, um, as even just learned the number of venues we have that count as computer science publications to allow this, the fact that this is a special event mm -hmm. at Simons as opposed to sort of a, uh, you know, it's the exception of the rule to have non-computer scientists here. I just so, <laughs> so I think that um, the, yeah. so, so in yeah. fact, Omer Reingold and I are actually trying, we're working to uh, start a new conference for mathematically strong research in exactly this field. I mean, well, in general, it doesn't have a name yet, I don't think. Um, but it will be for, for, for computer science that has an impact on social issues. And fairness would be, a, forgive the use of the term, fairness would be an example, privacy would be an example as well. So we agree that we need venues, more venues, uh, that recognize exactly this kind of work. And um, yeah. Oh, and also. Uh, the Journal of Privacy and Confidentiality will periodically have special issues that go beyond privacy and confidentiality to other issues of social questions. Um, I, yeah, just kind of, I guess, piggybacking off of a lot of the points that were just strung together um, and coming directly from an undergraduate institution and a liberal arts one at that, which you might expect to have more interdisciplinary talk uh, in a computer science education. I think it shouldn't be like it's important to talk about academic expert or like expert academia but then i think it's really like as somebody who's most of my cohort from that undergraduate institution went into uh industry and like will be ml practitioners uh but who don't hold a vocabulary to interrogate the social context behind the pra practicing that they do um and this is i guess less of a question and more of like a what do you think of this uh i I think like it shouldn't be underestimated how early that education of vocabulary should start. Like this should be, and directly off of the last point actually, like the norm should be present from the start of learning algorithms. Like we can't divorce the context clearly. And like, I feel like also what I've heard from most people, <coughs> computer scientists specifically at this conference has been like how interesting it is to finally have an interdisciplinary talk that's so interdisciplinary, like massively interdisciplinary. Um, and to have that really from the get-go. Because uh, I have no idea what it's even like in an engineering department, like, again, so. I have a couple comments. First of all, I don't want the pendulum to swing too far. You know, you really do have to understand depth first search. You have to, you have to get all of the mechanics of, of, of algorithms and other parts of computer science. Um, uh, Harvard is working, I mean, ha has a program where, with, with embedded ethics modules, so more and more computer science courses will have an ethicist coming in and doing, you know, doing some education. And we want to push that, I think, earlier and earlier. Um, um, there are other pedagogical uh, innovations. Martha Minow and I are teaching two courses that are intertwined. One is a straight computer science course on this topic and some other topics. And the other is a course in the law school. And the courses will meet together once a week and separately each once a week. Um, to, and part of the, one, one aspect will be cross-cultural dialogue. I mean, it's going to be a requirement, is presenting things that people with a different education, uh, intellectual tradition can understand. Um, did the pedagogy group, were you in the pedagogy group? Yeah, the small but uh, yeah, okay. very passionate pedagogy group. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I, ju I just, I do want to observe that it seems like some of the questions are overlapping with the next section, which we can blend into, but sure. if, if there are those in the line who would prefer to take their questions for the next section, which is general feedback and ethics and norms. In fact, we've I been just, going for more than would, half an hour. Yeah, as yeah. Is. yeah. Uh, yeah. We can say that, or we can just let this blend into the next one. But I think Nancy was next. Lunch. Wait, no, it's not lunch. I have lunch. 
three quick comments that relate to these different themes. One is that these kinds of questions have come up repeatedly in every single scientific discipline in very clear form since at least the early 1900s. There are earlier debates that can be traced, but there is a particular conference in 1930 that really put this all on the map in terms of the tensions within science. So it's to be expected that the social conflicts that are in the worlds that we live in manifest in the science that we do because we live in these worlds. It's very helpful to get a historical perspective to understand also how other disciplines, scientific disciplines, have engaged with these issues of where apolitical is confused with not being clear on what your values are or confusing objectivity with being apolitical because those are not the same things whatsoever. You do want to do rigorous science that others can replicate assuming that you had the same worldview and starting questions, but that's the big assumption in terms of who's asking which questions and coming with what sets of assumptions of what is relevant or not needed to actually test your questions. This gets debated in field after field. Duena can speak you know, just about anthropology and the extraordinary splits between the physical anthropologists and the cultural anthropologists <laughs> and the, the fights that have been riven. I can speak about it in epidemiology. I'm sure others that are here from other disciplines in sociology can speak about the fights between the people that take a fundamental methodologic individualist approach versus an approach that deals with populations is not as more than just simply sums of individuals. So this is normal, and it's good to have a frame where you can situate your own science in the context of many other debates that have happened in science. And I think with regard to what that means also for the pedagogy is actually making sure there's an introductory course. I teach an introductory course that's for all population health science PhD students, which is about history, politics, and public health, theories of disease distribution across time and culture, saying that Look, you want to understand, A, you have to understand a distribution, B, a population, C, how different groups have thought about this, and fought in every single generation over time about what the issues are, as also the phenomena itself is changing, because societies change, the disease patterns change. So how do you think about that and give that? And that's for people that have been like in, not just in epidemiology, but it's a lot of the different fields. That's really really critical. And I developed that course having studied here and gotten my PhD here at Berkeley and been really frustrated that nobody taught me what I wanted to know. I had to go do all this other reading and then I developed a course on the side. I had my first job when I was working at Kaiser and I like negotiated a different, working four long days a week so I could spend the fifth day as it were in the library and taught that course on training wheels here and then took it to where I next went. And it's also saying, you recognizing that there's a gap, go fill it, mm -hmm. and draw on people to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, uh, there, and I think it's again, not also conflating science equals A, objectivity, or B, truth, mm -hmm. but understanding that what is so wonderfully human about science is people coming together and also acting independently to try to test these ideas, to get a deep understanding of causal processes, whatever those things are, to turn it into knowledge that could potentially be just beautiful or useful. But the moment you start dealing with how humans are living and dying, it damn well better be more than just useful. Hi, I wanted to ask a completely different question, uh, which is, so we were talking a little bit about, you know, the, uh, the overwhelming need to opt people in now, right? So people will say, oh, well, we need more black faces, we need more examples. One of the, the things that's disturbed me about a lot of the current literature around facial recognition is there's a whole other literature on how bad we are at matching faces to pictures, right? So I think they, they tested like passport check officers and some of them are wrong, like uh, an abnormally large percentage of the time, like they're no better than random. Uh, and so I'm wondering, is there any recognition in, you know, sort of the like DNA to face sort of community, the communities that are like looking at these kinds of these translations, is there a recognition that when you get to that end product, it's not going to help you because we're just really bad at using that end product? Unfortunately, no, not in the, Sad, okay. not in the actual community that's developing these products. Um, there is a lot of hype that in fact, they will produce very precise faces. 
Now, when that happens, if it happens, we'll all hear about it, right? Because it will be the sort of slam dunk. But so far, there have been almost a dozen cases now where those faces have been made uh, since 2015, and there hasn't been an exact match of the DNA at the crime scene. <coughs> now, when Andrew Pollack wrote that article, the scientists actually generated faces for the science editorial team at the New York Times. And the science desk has about 50 or so people working at the science desk. And um, so imagine you're in your department and someone generates a DNA face for all your colleagues who you see every day. Now, people could not recognize a major guy at the New York Times from the face that was generated. Um, they could recognize a woman. Um, she was the only um, minority in the, in, the, in the group. Oh, okay. And she was female, so that was sort of easier. Um, but in terms of the no better than random, you know, it, it's on that level. And so there is not a lot of humility or, um, you know, just a spaciousness around this problem that, oh, perhaps we could be doing this differently or this is not going to be exact. I guess it's the, uh, like, I believe that maybe it's possible that someday you could do even a semi-perfect mapping, but there is research that suggests that when you have the perfect mapping, the actual yeah. photograph of the person, yeah. we can't use it. Which is fascinating. Even if you have the perfect mapping in terms of the photograph, it's not precise. Yeah. Thank you. And we should probably take a break now. Okay.